Hello, welcome to another episode of Candid Conversations. I'm Jahara, and I am very fortunate to have with me today Vijay, who is here from, are you here from Dubai? Or? Yes. Yeah, and he is the MD of Techstars for MENA, Turkey, Pakistan, India, and uh, somebody who's worked in the entrepreneurial space, in academics, and has been a mentor and advisor and investor. So loads of things there. Uh, so what brings you to Pakistan, Vijay? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> well, firstly, thank you for having me here on the show. And uh, great space, by the way. Thank you. I met some amazing founders today, thanks to your introductions. And um, uh, as, a, as, as Techstars, we've been um, growing by leaps and bounds over the last decade. Right. And we invest in globally. Uh, today, we are the most active investor on the planet. Okay, amazing. Uh, we have invested 600 companies in 2022. This year in 23, we're investing close to 700, 720 companies. And at what stage? All at pre -seed. Okay. All at pre -seed. And typically, you know, um, the application pools actually has doubled oh. from last year. And from last year's double from the previous year. So we're looking at the trend. Um, we seem to attract a lot more applications from the rest of the world. Predominantly, it's been from the North America region, right. but now increasingly the rest of the world, particularly in Asia. So my mission is to really build the connective tissue with the ecosystem players, such as yourself, right. uh, enablers in the ecosystem, VCs, angel investors, and of course the founders. So coming to each city, like Karachi, uh, it really gives you a good sense of the pulse on the ground, uh, talking to them, understanding the space that they're focusing on right. as challenges. And so I'm, from the, from the very basic level, I'm here to basically suss out and engage the marketplace. But more in terms of a tangible result, uh, outcome for me, would be getting uh, interest to apply to many of the Texas programs that we have right. around the world. Right and whether it's the Texas Accelerator programs, right. the Texas Founder Catalyst program, which is a pre-accelerator, and even Startup Weekend. So these are main three tracks that companies can participate in. And so... Um, Startup Weekends we've been hosting of course. for a long time. Yes. Yeah. And they're really, I mean, they're amazing. And we've been hosting them at different levels, even for children. Uh, ages. I was not aware of that. To, yeah. Yes. So, and you should see some of the ideas those kids come up with. And some of them have actually taken them to the next level. Have they? So it's been really exciting. So coming to Pakistan for the first time, you say, yes. um, what you've heard, I'm sure you've heard about the Pakistan startup ecosystem and yes. all that. What you've heard and what you've seen in the two days that you've been here, you were in Lahore and now you're here in yeah. Karachi. Uh, what is your assessment of the startup ecosystem? I know it's unfair to ask you yeah. such a well, little bit. Well, it's been a very short visit so yeah. far. But I can give you just a general sense, and again, this is not um, substantiated with deep uh, sure. facts course, and understood. data, but yeah. basically conversations I've had on the ground. So look, I think two years ago, uh, the country has benefited from a lot of investments, particularly flowing in. Yes into the country, setting up by international funds out of Singapore, the Middle East, and the US, and so on. And that's been a fantastic, um, I would say, um, um, uh, you know, support of good faith yes. that there's confidence in the country. Um, but beside that influx of capital that came in two years and a year ago, there's always been evidence of high quality talent coming out of Pakistan. How do we know this? We've seen an increased number of <clears throat> applications coming through our pipeline. Right. And they've been applying to programs in Canada. You have a gentleman here, Samir. Yes. Who's applied to our program in Toronto, for example. Uh, they've been applying to programs in, in Europe and across the United States. So that has been consistently growing. Right. Um, but we've not had a program here as yet. And the reason is because typically when we look at the country profile, we just want to be guaranteed there is some uh, threshold that we can meet, i.e. this ecosystem has to be matured enough for you to support a large investor network, uh, particularly from the angel, angel investors, family offices, and of course VCs. Right. That is yet to come. 
Okay. Okay. And we think it's going to get there in a matter of time. And that we can then plug in to be a player in the ecosystem by providing acceleration for those companies. Um, now, in spite of the gloom and doom um, talk about the economics and the current political environment, I can assure you that the energy in the streets on the ground doesn't suggest that. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and, and you look at the sheer demographics uh, that's growing by leap and bound. In the last 20 years, the population has doubled, right? Imagine yes. what's going to happen in the next 20 years. So the consumption power, the utilization of consumer goods to uh, technology apps, for example. Yes. And even on the B2B side, uh, the industries are just going to grow to cater for the increasing demographics. So the literal uh, facts on the ground that the economy is moving upwards um, in terms of consumption, user base, uh, and so on and so forth. The currencies, inflation, all these external factors will adjust for itself. Yeah, they in, do. In always. years to come, yes. they always do. And entrepreneurs are smart; they know how to figure things out. So I'm very optimistic, given my conversations I've had with the ecosystem so far, that this is going to be a place of um, immense opportunities. For starters, I think there's a lot of great talent here that can optimize the footprint in the MENA region. Look in Saudi Arabia, for example. Yes, absolutely. The UAE. Uh, There's a lot of interest. A lot of interest, and I think because of the resilience of the entrepreneurs uh, that's gone through a fairly harsh environment, they can really be hyper-competitive competing in these markets that I mentioned because uh, the conditions are far more um, harsh, if you like. In, yeah. right? So I think this is really the opportunity for Pakistan entrepreneurs. So as startups here continue to grow, what is the advice that you would give to founders who are competing for the best resources against you know, larger startups and organizations who also want to grow their companies and are actually trying to take in the most talented people within Pakistan. What can they do to attract such talent and retain them? I think for startups, um, for starters, they have an um, inherent advantage, which is they have much more agility to, to manure than, say, established enterprise, in spite of not having the resources. Number two, th there's two perspectives of this, is what's your addressable market? I am the one that will encourage uh, Pakistan entrepreneurs to think that the marketplace is a globe, as opposed to just uh, the land of Pakistan. And for the simple reasons, because the entrepreneurs here <clears throat> can leverage on their vast human capital, to be exported to the rest of the world, particularly in terms of former IT services and other solutions. Third, um, fundraising today is not as easy as it was okay. two years ago. Absolutely. But that's not unique to Pakistan, as you know. True. True. Right? It's the same story elsewhere. It's becoming harder. And I think Pakistan entrepreneurs, as I've learned in the last couple of days, are far more accustomed to work with much more frugal environments in terms of being cost conscious. And I think they have the ability to be more resilient to work within these uh, conditions. So I'm very optimistic that they have a better chance. Um, and fourthly, I think, you know, as the rest of the world is slowing down, um, downsizing, looking for cheaper cost of solutions, um, if you're building a product for the world from Pakistan, you have tremendous cost advantages. Absolutely. that can be taken advantage of. Right. So you work, let's move on to MENA now. What are you seeing in MENA? Which are the verticals that are you know, growing? And where do you see this growth happening in the next five to 10 years? Which are the verticals that MENA companies are focusing on right now? So I think it's very widespread. Um, the ones that are getting a lot of traction and continue to do so is the e-commerce space. So right. whether it's logistics, supply chain, uh, fintech embedded solutions, this continues to grow. What it seems to be very exciting is the media and gaming sector, uh, particularly uh, in Saudi Arabia. Yes. And um, we we'll also see in some niche areas the issue of food security, water security, uh, energy security 
which is driving either clean tech or renewables or any solutions that, that addresses those. And now, not just in the emerging markets, but also outside. It's a global the issue. Yeah. But it's been accentuated because um, there is a suddenly, a, a, not ocean is a sudden, but there is a realization that um, where a lot of the Gulf countries, which are predominantly um, supported by hydrocarbons as the, uh, you know, as a pillar of uh, economic uh, powerhouse, is that we need to create a sense of urgency to transform, and that transformation is driving interesting new opportunities. So, a digitizing the economy, b infrastructure is being put in for supply chain, manufacturing, agriculture, to name a few. So that's opening up new opportunities, constructions, and so on. But also uh, into new services, tourism, yes. uh, entertainment, uh, and so on. So this allows for new industries to flourish in this massive transformation taking place across the Middle East. So I think back to the question about how Pakistan should think about this, is saying, how do we um, take this new wave of the reset that's taking place in the Gulf countries in particular. And uh, the good thing is that they, there's available funding for a lot of these companies to, take, to be taken advantage of. Right. So they can well position themselves in the footprint using the human capital from Pakistan. That's going to give them a lot of advantage. Right. So in terms of policies, because we're at, uh, at a stage where uh, it's important to focus on policies that are going to help us grow and not impede the growth of the startup sector as well as the tech sector. Uh, having seen what's happening globally, which are the areas that you think we need to focus on most? As our policy is concerned, yeah. I think the good news I've heard is that at least companies now can um, raise capital Yes. Uh, in a in a top code, a whole code, say in Singapore or yes. uh, ADGM, and then basically have an operating company in Pakistan. So yes. that's a good thing that has been allowed. Uh, hence, the reflection of capital flows into many of the companies here. That paves the way for a far more vibrant venture capital industry that's going to take place. Right. The challenge remains is basically when you do an exit. Uh, acquisitions for, is it going to be a local exit or is it going to be a foreign exit? And for companies of, of certain size and scale, depending on the industry, whether it's fintech or uh, certain industries that might attract uh, anti-competition law, those are something we want to be con of concern about. In addition to that, uh, data privacy yes. is something that we want to be uh, of concern. Cyber security is a massive challenge around the world, and it will be a case here, particularly if your customers that you're servicing uh, across the globe will sanction uh, high rates of compliance to be, to be taking care of those issues. Last but not least, I think the challenge is going to be that if the whole world is looking to uh, Pakistan for a highly competitive workforce or human capital, then you as a founder have that challenge to keep up uh, in terms of uh, retaining your talent. And I, I see that as a, as a challenge. That's going to be a challenge, That's yeah. Right. But training and retraining those resources, maybe creating opportunities for them so that they're excited about what you're doing. I guess right. that is the way to go. That's right. Okay, let's talk a little bit about you. You've been investing um, and you've been growing and going into in different directions. Logistic e-commerce, all of that has been an area of interest for you. But what about personally? I read that you're interested in cultural and heritage sites. So top three around the world, which are the ones that you've seen that you found very exciting and which are the ones that are still on your list that you would like to see? <laughs> Well, that's a good one. Um, so, you know, I've, um, I'm always, uh, I was never good at history because yeah. I could not pay attention in class. But uh, I remember my, um, you know, when I was in grade five or six, I was fascinated with one te his history teacher. She's just presented history in a very fascinating way. And visually, I was just intrigued by all these wonderful civilizations around the world. Now you put me on the spot, one of my top three. But the, the three that actually uh, came to mind is the Angkor Wat 
uh, civilization, which is Cambodia, Borobudur in Indonesia, and the Mayan culture, the Mayan pyramids oh, wow. in Mexico. Yeah. So I have a chance to visit all three over, my, Amazing. You know, over the <laughs> lifetime. It's pretty interesting to see how thousands of years ago, the, the skill they had in terms of planning, design, uh, scientific, um, so-called calculus that went into their development. But more importantly is how civilization rose and suddenly disappeared. And it's actually a history in, in for, for mankind to think about how organizations are built and cities are built, uh, which I think when we look at Asia today, which is going through, uh, I think, a massive boom across this part, of the, this part of the world, South Asia, the Far East, the Middle East, Africa. It's interesting to see uh, what's the life cycle of these, this civilization that's taking place. So I asked them my question. But for me, it's it, more than from the economic and the business point of view, I try, and my interest is really learning about people. Right. You know, I've lived in eight different cities in my lifetime, I've had the privilege to do that in different continents. And I find that um, there's always that human connections that, you know, to culture, you can connect with people. So I, I'm still a student. I'm trying to learn um, about the human race through civilizations and culture. And uh, that's the joy of going out and visiting heritage sites. And the last question. So you've been, as you said, in six countries, and you love cycling. As far as scenic beauty of cycling, which, which country did you find is the best for pursuing that interest of yours? Well, I'm split between two. I think one is Switzerland. If you have a chance to bike yeah. down the Alps, just an amazing, pick the right weather. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. The most recent one, which I did with my, with my two sons, we did a boys trip, uh, was at the Grand Canyon. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. that was about a couple of years back. And uh, it's pretty astonishing to see uh, the various colors that's reflected across the canyon. Uh, just the majestic size of it is pretty extraordinary. So if you have a chance to do both, uh, please do so. Thank you so much. And when do you, we see you back in Pakistan? Well, inshallah, I would say that <laughs> sooner than later. Definitely not in 24 years. And for much longer, I hope. Yes, of course. And I would love to come back. I can tell you that I think, you know, uh, the proximity between Dubai, which is a, my home base now, uh, to Karachi is very easy to get yes. to. Yes. Uh, but also the connective tissue between the ecosystems getting stronger. Uh, we've already been investing in, um, uh, you know, founders from Pakistan. Uh, we see uh, capital flows going back and forth, and I can only imagine it's going to get stronger. So very much that's my responsibility at Texas is to integrate the region, uh, build the connections, and I guarantee you'll be back sooner than you think. Thank you. It's been great to have you it's here. It's been a pleasure. And next time we'll have a much longer conversation. I know you're short on time. Thank you. But I'm really thankful that you took the time to have a conversation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Jan. That's all from this episode of Candid Conversations. See you again next time. <laughs>